Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Ron Joyce is the president and CEO of Joyce Farms, which was started in 1962 by Alvin Joyce and is still a family-owned business today. Alvin's son, Ron, and his his two sons, Ryan and Stuart, lead the farm located in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Joyce Farms has come a long way since the company was founded in 1962, going from just selling chickens to raising the very best all-natural poultry, beef, and game for the top chefs, artisanal butchers, and educated consumers across the U.S. through regenerative agriculture. Welcome to the show, Ron. Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do. Of course. Yeah, very excited to learn more today. Um, So why don't you tell us a little bit more about the Joyce Farm story? Well, we started out as a poultry distributor, and um, uh, that led us into doing some further processing And I guess it was several years ago, um, I saw a need to, uh, that was not being filled, uh, to basically give chefs what they were looking for um, in poultry. And so we started doing all natural programs and uh, we're probably one of the first to to, uh, raise birds and sell birds that were raised without antibiotics. So this was our venture into that natural realm. but I was intrigued by it. And a lot of the chefs that were buying products from us at the time had European backgrounds or had trained, had done some training in Europe. And when it came to poultry, they kept asking me about La Belle Rouge, of which at the time I knew nothing about. Uh, upon researching it, um, I, I looked at the program in France, thought it was pretty neat uh, that uh, as the poultry industry had started moving more and more toward industrial production, the French being pretty stubborn and wanting to hang on to their old uh, way of doing things and the products that they uh, had had for generations, uh, developed this program called La Belle Rouge, which basically was to uh, reward suppliers uh, that were going to stay with the old genetics and the old way of uh, farming. Uh, and give them a special designation, which ended up being La Belle Rouge. Um, my main um, goal, I guess, at the time was to find the best chicken and the best poultry in the world. And I feel like I found it um, with the La Belle Rouge program in France. And the key to that program was old breeds, going back to slower-growing genetics that were primarily developed for um, flavor and the culinary characteristics. Whereas today in industrial production, it's all about the price and how cheaply can you produce the product and how much of it can you produce. So uh, the chicken has gone through uh, amazing changes, um, and most of them primarily uh, being driven by price and efficiency. Um, The average chicken in the 60s and 70s would take about uh, uh, 14 weeks. Uh, 12 to 14 weeks to get to a size that would be between two and a half and three pounds dressed. And the feed conversion would be about three pounds of feed for every one pound of uh, of animal weight. What we've gone to today is a very efficient system that produces chickens very cheaply, but we can get to a dress weight of four to five pounds in six weeks with a feed conversion of 1.6 pounds to every pound of uh, of live weight. So so they've been the the industrial side of the business has been very successful in producing a lot of product at a very low price. However, we have lost a lot when it comes to flavor and the culinary attributes that the older birds had. So this was really the beginning for me uh, when I started on this journey to 
to try to develop the best taste, the best flavor, the best culinary characteristics of products for chefs. And that, and about that time, uh, we well, shortly after we had started that program, I ran into Dr. Alan Williams, who was uh, very uh, interested in preserving the old original Aberdeen Angus beef breed, uh, which was developed by Hugh Watson back in the 1840s in, uh, in Scotland. And not sure if you or your audience is familiar with the old original Aberdeen Angus, but it's very different from the uh, modern Angus of today. Uh, slower growing, smaller animals, much more flavor. And uh, when it's raised on a, a very uh, 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 controlled uh, and carefully planned and planted pasture, uh, can develop amazing results. We're getting USDA choice and prime out of cattle that are grazed 100% on grass. Uh, and not just, you know, grass fed. Uh, you and your audience may be aware of these sometimes misleading statements that are made by people who say grass uh, raised or uh, uh, grass fed. Well, yeah. honestly, all cattle starts on grass, but, but it's the finishing that makes the difference. And, and we do this with 100% uh, pasture and, and forages all the way up through the finish. That's that's really awesome, Ron. And, and thank you for sharing all that deep history. It's, it's really interesting how you came at it from this genetic component. Um, and can, can you elaborate a little bit more on the regenerative side? Why did you choose to use um, grass finishing? And, and why, why do you focus on regenerative agriculture? Well. Another large part of our program <clears throat> that that is we have learned contributes a lot to the to the better flavor is better animal welfare and uh, pasture raised rather than raising animals and uh, cattle in feedlots that are confined and being fed corn uh, is just not natural for the animals. Uh, these animals are are uh, made basically to eat forages, uh, grasses and forages, not corn. They don't digest corn very well. So it's, it's more of a natural method of raising uh, uh, cattle uh, to do it in a pasture. The problem that we were faced with is not much grass-fed cattle uh, had the uh, culinary attributes and the flavor and consistency that chefs wanted uh, for, for their restaurants. So. Um, we went in that direction when I, in working with Dr. Alan Williams, that he had basically preserved this old breed of cattle, and he had also developed a managed uh, pasture program uh, where the uh, the uh, grazing was controlled and the planting was controlled. We we have uh, at least sixteen to eighteen, sometimes up to twenty different species of plants that are put into our pastures. And the cattle are moved on a regular basis, and there's lots of reasons for that. That's a part of the regenerative program. By the way, getting into pasture programs, we've also recently introduced a a heritage pork program uh, with a breed that came uh, from uh, Gloucestershire, England. Uh, Again, based on flavor and the culinary attributes of that meat. But you know, the the it goes much further than flavor when it comes to the to these animals. Um, particularly in beef, uh, 100% grass-fed is much healthier, um, and and you, you and your audience are probably aware of the difference between the the, uh, the saturated fats versus unsaturated fats and the uh, omega six to omega three ratios, which which make it a much uh, healthier product. So, the basically the first uh, goal was flavor, but in doing that, we realized that the, the genetics was important. The growing conditions was important. The type of uh, pastures that they, the animals were raised on was important. And the overall animal welfare was important. And all leads to healthier, uh, better tasting animals. Um, Dr. Williams has been in the forefront of developing the regenerative agriculture program in this country. Uh, he and some, uh, some of his uh, uh, fellow farmers, ranchers, and uh, scientists have formed uh, two entities the Soil Health Academy, to teach uh, farmers about uh, growing products regeneratively, and also a company called uh, Understanding Ag. 
And it basically, uh, regenerative agriculture eliminates most of the inputs that we've been traditionally taught at the university level and, and beyond um, when it comes to industrial farming. And, and, and that's really kind of driven to increase yields, but doesn't necessarily increase profitability for the farmers. So what do you have any particular aspect of the regenerative part that you want to go into? Yeah, um, it, that's really helpful, Ron, and, and super interesting um, to hear how you think about it, not just in terms of environmental impact, but also taste to the consumer, um, the health benefits to the consumer. It's all very relevant. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, how does it work on your farm in terms of um, multiple animals? Um, how do they interact how does that influence the regenerative process um, and, and, and that whole ecosystem? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> first of all, let me clarify. We have multiple farms and we, we contract with farmers. So we're a very small company, but we still have uh, multiple farms that we work with, uh, always looking for small farmers who really care about uh, animal welfare and care about uh, the animals themselves and take pride in producing an exceptionally high quality product. Um, I'll, I'll mention another benefit though, that the regenerative probably starting after the second year uh, has extreme benefits to the farmer. As you probably know, we are losing uh, farmers every year at a, at a fairly alarming rate. Uh, <clears throat> farming has gotten to the point that it's just not profitable. So, a lot of farmers are quitting, um, and and more importantly, though, because of this, the lack of financial uh, opportunities, their children and a lot of young people are not going back to the farms uh, when they leave and and uh, get an education, or you know when they decide to choose a career. So it's very important that we make farming profitable. Uh, so that we continue to attract young people to replace the farmers who are retiring or aging out. Um, we've had significant successes in, in basically being able to drastically improve over about a three year, three to four year period, uh, the bottom line for the farmers. <coughs> and, and this comes primarily from reducing all of the inputs, um, from uh, synthetic fertilizers to chemicals. Uh, and it's not only the 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 um, uh, products that have to be bought to farm industrially, uh, but you also have to pay someone to drive a tractor, put the fuel in the tractor, maintain the tractor to spread all of these uh, all of these items. So uh, we basically get back to letting nature uh, do the work for us. But uh, most most of our farmland is already pretty depleted. Uh, there's very low carbon in the soil any uh, today due to over farming and just for our farming methods, not being uh, uh, correct. Uh, for example, almost all farmers are plow in the springtime. And we've known now for a number of years that plowing is very degenerative uh, plowing and, and cutting the soil uh, and using any kind of implements uh, causes a loss of moisture and also a loss of uh, carbon uh, that is, needed in the soil to uh, for good plant health. This episode is brought to you by Optimal Carnivore. Optimal Carnivore was created by carnivores for carnivores. They've recently released a new product, a grass-fed bone marrow. It is the whole bone extract, which includes the bone marrow, the cartilage, and collagen peptides. Our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal, including bones, and especially the marrow. All the nutrients and substance that your body needs to build, repair, and maintain your bones, teeth, and connective tissue can come from the bone marrow. It's a complex that contains the same components as home-cooked bone broth, but making bone broth can be a hassle. You have to source high-quality bones, boil them for days, and this is a simple, convenient alternative that's gently freeze-dried so it preserves all the nutrients completely intact. It's perfect for people who are traveling or don't have time to make bone broth themselves. Visit www.amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code carnivore10 to receive 10% off your purchase. I'm curious, Ron, you know, how have you talk about interacting with other farmers and being influenced by Alan Williams and others? Um, you know, how, how did you first come about regenerative agriculture and how have you learned some of the methodology and the practices and 
you're, I'm sure you're refining your approach constantly. Um, you know, how do you continue to educate yourself on regenerative practices? Um, I guess I was first exposed to it um, with a farmer that Alan was working with in Norfolk, Nebraska. His name was Wayne Rasmussen, and he was a cattle rancher. He had called Alan in. This may have been right about the time we started our cattle program in 2010 or 11, um, because he was in Nebraska, and he noticed that his water tables, his water levels were, were going down, his streams were drying up, his springs were drying up, and it's very difficult to raise cattle, um, particularly if you're doing a grass-fed program with uh, without water. So this was a, a crisis for uh, for Wayne, and Alan started working with him on regenerative principles and to to actually help him open up the land. One of the advantages of regenerative is that the land uh, becomes more uh, increases the ability to absorb and retain moisture when we do get rains. So a typical farm today, you know, it can take an hour or longer for a half an inch of rain to be absorbed. And most of the time it isn't absorbed. It sits in puddles and evaporates or uh, more devastatingly, it, it uh, runs off. And with that runoff, it takes a valuable topsoil and also takes chemicals that have been applied to the land. So uh, one of the many benefits of regenerative is that you you uh, start retaining the moisture that you need during those hot, dry months in the summer. So he he had hired Alan to actually help him resolve the problem of his lower water tables. And I think it took two or three years, but eventually his streams came back, his springs came back, and he restored his uh, his water levels. And, and although I considered that a pretty neat story, uh, I said to Wayne one day, I said, well, basically, he saved your, your ranch. And he said, well, he, he did more than that. He said, that isn't the best part of the story. And I said, well, what is the best part of the story? And he said, all of the inputs, all the money that I used to spend on inputs, farming uh, traditionally or or um, uh, commercially, are now in my bank account. Those are checks I didn't write. Yeah, it's amazing when it works out like that. And it's kind of a win-win-win. I know it can't always work for all all farmers or all all situations, but it's it's great when it does. Well, um, regenerative will work with all farmers in all situations and all locations. Uh, th- this is a common misconception. Um, uh, Alan has done work in the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico where they get very, very little rain and been successful. Uh, Gabe Brown, who is in North Dakota, uh, is able to graze almost year-round in North Dakota. So we hear that all the time that people say, well, this won't work in North Carolina or it won't work in, in uh, other states. And Gabe Brown always says, if it'll work in North Dakota, it'll work anywhere. Yeah, that's that's really impressive. I, I hadn't heard of it going on in, in cold climates like that. And um, moving down the supply chain a little bit, Ron, can you talk about harvesting, how you harvest the beef, the process, and, and some of the choices you make there? Yes. Uh, well, when we put the the time and invest the money into the best breeds in the world and we raise them very carefully and, and raise them in a great environment. Uh, we have a, a, a pretty good investment, a, a much higher investment in these animals than in commercial uh, production and, and animals in a commercial system. Um, so one of the things we want to do is make sure that they're processed carefully. Uh, the the um, heritage poultry, which is our La Belle Rouge chicken, our Poulet Rouge, and our game birds, which is a, a we do a a, a, a pintad, a French guinea, and then a pheasant. Uh, we also uh, during the holiday seasons we do a Spanish black turkey. Those animals are processed in our own plant, uh, and I'm very happy to tell you that uh, people look at slaughter as a kind of a I guess a necessary evil, and, and it's uh, kind of frowned upon in some in some ways, but. We take the animal welfare very seriously, even at the, at the slaughter level in our plant. We have an independent third-party uh, audit every year to evaluate our slaughter process in our in our poultry plant, and we've got 100% rating on on the process for slaughter and harvesting uh, the poultry. Um, we also in our plant on all the heritage birds, they're air chilled. Um, 
like they're done in Europe and like the, the following the La Belle Rouge program in France. Air chilling can enhance flavor if the bird is grown of a breed and, and in a way that the, uh, the flavor is there. Unfortunately, with a lot of commercial birds, they're grown so quickly and there's so little time for flavor to develop that air chilling really doesn't add much of a benefit. But with the type of birds we grow and taking 12 weeks to grow, for example, the chicken or 14 or 16 weeks to grow some of the other birds, the flavor is there. We have to make sure we don't ruin it with uh, using chlorinated water or, or other methods of chilling. So we do a strictly air chilling process in our plant. <clears throat> the cattle, we contract with a, a medium-sized plant in the southeast that has the same standards. They are uh, animal welfare. Their animal welfare is approved. They are gap rated. And by the way, our, our, uh, our, our poulet rouge, our poultry, and our, and our cattle are all gap step four. Um, and the processing plant has to be gap approved too to carry that uh, designation. So we're very, uh, uh, very conscious again about animal welfare and the processing plant and sanitation and food safety. Uh, I've often said that uh, in our cattle plant, which can be a, a, a at times a, that can be a messy uh, operation, is clean enough to almost uh, have surgery. So uh, it's it's the, they they have a very high level of food safety and and sanitation that plant, and the packaging uh, is important. So uh, you know we we try to to pay attention to all the details from the selection of the genetics, the way it's grown, what it's fed how it's handled during transportation, and how it's processed and packed. Uh, pork is the same way that our pork program is grown right now under an AWA uh, animal welfare program. And uh, again, processed at a small plant in North Carolina where animal welfare is very uh, uh, high on their list. So uh, less stress to animals make better, better uh, food. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, what I found fascinating is discovering some of the work of Temple Grandin around that and, and some of the ways she revolutionized um, the harvesting process for beef. And, and folks can look into that super interesting well, story. The, the, corral, the corral system in our processor was designed by her. And, and I usually mention that, but fortunately for the industry and for the animals, most slaughter plants now have adapted her uh, corral and loading unloading and loading system into the plants. So that's a positive for the entire industry. Yeah. She's had a massive impact. Um, and, and Ron curious, uh, you know, mo moving even further on, on this, um, kind of supply chain narrative, uh, can you talk a little bit about your opinions on direct to consumer and, and maybe some of the challenges you're facing with it? Uh, yes, <clears throat> we, uh, we have traditionally sold to chefs. Uh, mostly through uh, distributors, uh, specialized distributors who concentrate on center of the plate and on high-end proteins. Uh, <clears throat> we saw our business drop about 95% in three days back in March uh, when the, uh, uh, the uh, Chinese virus hit and, and restaurants were ordered to close or basically close their dining rooms. Most of our customers were fine dining restaurants and, and chefs that own and operate those. So our business really ground to, to a halt. We've had a website for a number of years, but um, we really didn't do a lot of business on the website. And so direct to consumer, when this happened, um, a, a couple of things caused us to pivot into doing more direct to the consumer. Uh, the lack of the food service business, of course, was was one of them. But uh, shortly after uh, things started locking down, uh, we had people show up at our plant asking if they could buy directly from us because there was a, a huge food insecurity that I'd never seen before. People were coming to us saying the grocery stores have no meat or poultry. You know, can we buy direct? And, you know, we're set up to ship 20 and 40 pound boxes and um, not really thinking the consumer would be interested in that. But I guess people were afraid and kind of desperate. So, and, and we were cut off. Our governor made the announcement at 10 o'clock one morning that restaurants would, would not be allowed to have diners inside at five o'clock that afternoon. That was in North Carolina. And of course, it happened to us from Maine all the way through the Keys uh, that restaurants got shut down. So we were caught with a lot of product on hand 
and know where to go with it. So we did three days of a parking lot sale where we were selling wholesale uh, right from our plant, right to consumers and help oh, wow. us adjust and get our inventory uh, back in line. We started putting more emphasis on our website and, and putting more products on the website. We also pivoted from doing 20 pound boxes or 40 pound boxes into doing smaller boxes. So we started adapting to instead of five or 10 pound packages to one pound packages instead of 20 or 40 pound boxes to eight, uh, eight, uh, or, or maybe as low as four pound packages up to maybe eight or 10 pound packages or boxes. Fortunately for us, one of our largest distributors that had been almost strictly food service in the Northeast uh, made a change very quickly in about a two week period of time and set up uh, an online ordering process to allow them to take orders and do home deliveries. And in the Northeast where people were basically quarantined and, and, and under uh, stay at home orders, uh, it was a great move on their part to, um, to do home deliveries. Our product has been very well accepted by their customers. It has grown to the point that we are shipping this distributor as much or more volume of product now than we were before the pandemic started. So, so that's worked out pretty well. We're still not back up to 100%, but uh, all of those things that we have done have, have helped us rebuild the business. I will tell you that <clears throat> we are fighting a problem right now with uh, delivery uh it seems that because of the uh the, the since the uh, pandemic hit there's a lot more uh at home ordering and delivering and ups and fedex are struggling to keep up with that we just had a conference call today with our provider for these services who said that um their business is, has jumped as much as if they were in a holiday season the difference being that they plan for a holiday season and they hire extra people. Um, their volume is up so much that they're really short on people, and we're having we're having errors in the shipping. We're having product going to the wrong address. We're having product not being delivered in the time frame in the two to three days a time that we're supposed to be getting, uh, which is highly uh, important and a perishable with a perishable item. And we're having uh, orders that just don't show up at all. <clears throat> they're completely lost. And in talking to one of the uh, the uh, companies, coordinating companies for these shipments, they said that um, both companies, UPS and FedEx, has attempted to hire new people as they would staff up for the holidays. But because of the federal bonus on unemployment, uh, people are not accepting the jobs. They're they're making as much or more money staying home as they would be if they if they accepted the employment. So I'm hoping right. uh, Congress is not going to extend this uh, $600 weekly bonus uh, and that that's going to encourage people to go back to work. Yeah, that's it's great to hear that you're adapting to the times um, and able to find pockets of positive things in, in the struggles that we hear a lot of farmers and ranchers going through right now. And, and Ron, you've talked a bit about some of the myths you hear around grass-fed, grass-finished, but what are some of the more common ones from the mainstream um, or criticisms of what you're doing You know, from, from vegans or the lay media or anything like that? What are some things that you see in, in kind of the, um, in, in pop culture uh, and some of the myths that you face most often around the work you're doing? Well... And of course, one of the biggest ones is that uh, regenerative and grass-fed production is maybe okay, but you can't feed the world doing it. Well, I think Dr. Williams and his team of people who are training farmers have just proved that. And he's absolutely convinced that we could produce uh, all of the meat uh, that we need in this country if it was all done through regenerative farming and, and pasture-raised. Um, so I think that's one myth. Um, the, um, the, there's so many benefits to it, though, for the farmer, for the consumer, for the health of the consumer, and for the animals. And I think people are beginning to learn more and more what those benefits are. So that that is possibly going to help support companies like ours uh, and in, encourage more people to do this. It's a leap. <clears throat> uh, when we approached our farmers about doing this, 
Uh, they were very skeptical, as you can imagine. And it's a scary change. And particularly one farmer uh, that we have is in is the 10th generation of, of uh, operating the same farm um, in his family. And they, you know, the common thing that they said was, well, this may work down in Alabama or Mississippi where Alan, Alan's from, but it's not going to work in North Carolina. And we hear that a lot. Uh, so we had to convince the farmer to try it, just to try a small portion of his, of his farm. Uh, he was the guy that's, that, that is growing our pork now because we wanted the animals grown on regenerative farms. Um, and he reluctantly agreed to try it for a year. We fortunately had such great success and he could see with his own eyes the benefits that he got just from the first year that now he is all in. And in fact, uh, he hosted a soil health Academy a couple of years ago to invite some of his uh, neighbors to, to attend and learn more about it. That's great. Uh, I think what we really need is just more, more education um, from all sides, uh, all well, angles. For, I do want to mention something from the consumer standpoint where yeah, there's please. misinformation. Um, and, and that is on grass fed. A lot of people try to, because the, the, the demand, the demand for grass fed beef exceeds what we can produce in this country. So as you probably know, uh, a lot of the product is imported. Um, but there is demand for, for grass fed more, more than we're meeting this, this country. But it has led some companies to sort of mislead the consumer and their customer on whether it's 100% grass fed or finished all cattle starts on grass you know when when a, you have a mama cow and a and a calf uh, on pasture uh, and and the calf is nursing they are on grass they're on pasture but at some point uh, after weaning when that uh, calf uh, gets old enough and large enough to be finished they usually are finished on grain uh, primarily corn and that changes a lot of the dynamics of uh, within the animal itself, within the digestive system of that animal, with the animal's health, and also the meat, uh, the, 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 the health benefits of grass-fed beef goes away when the animal is fed the, uh, the grain and the corn. Um, because there is such a demand for grass-fed and because cattle, all cattle starts on grass, people sometimes say, yes, my cattle are, are all grass-fed. And sometimes they'll be a little more honest and say, but we finish them on corn. Well, that's the way the entire commercial cattle industry uh, operates. There are some people who are raising uh, cattle in a pasture, but feeding them corn in the pasture uh, toward the end of the uh, of their finishing. And they're still calling it pasture raised and they're still calling it grass raised because and they're calling it free choice. They are putting corn and um, uh, and grain out and making it available for the cattle. But to be honest, if there's little to no grass to eat, of course the cattle are going to go to the corn. So um, my concern is a lot of people are buying products that are labeled and being advertised, even in restaurants, as grass-fed, and they really are not grass-fed and grass-finished. So I think that's very misleading to the consumer. Yeah, I, I can see how that would be. I, I see that a lot just in my own life, but um, yeah, it's crazy to hear about how, how much the grass fed label is just kind of thrown around. And um, can you talk a little bit, Ron, about Philip Meese and some of your work with the carnivore bar and how that relationship came about? Well, that was kind of funny. Um, um, I was on a van leaving a grass fed beef conference uh, 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 put on by the grass fed exchange. Um, and I was going to the airport. And he happened to be on the same airport van. And so we struck up a conversation and <clears throat> he was interested in, in the genetics we were using and in the, uh, uh, in our regenerative farming program. And I think he had heard Alan speak at one of the conferences, um, and was interested in our product. I think he was just starting the company. What impressed me about him was he, he was adamant about finding the best product, the highest quality and the healthiest uh, product that he could buy uh, for his product line. And that's really refreshing when you're doing something like what we're doing. What we're doing costs more money. 
uh, it takes much longer, months longer to finish the cattle and, and there's a lot higher cost in it. Um, so, you know, to meet someone who's actually looking for that kind of product and looking for product that's different from commodity, uh, and particularly caring enough about his customer and his end consumer that he wants high quality, nutritious, uh, uh, and healthy beef to go into the products that he makes. So that's, that was, that was my first meeting with him and, and we've been in touch ever since. Yeah, Philip. Philip is great. Um, I had a chance chance to meet him and interact with him over the last year or so, and just really impressed with the care and relentlessness and focus on quality he has in creating the carnivore bar. So, not surprised at all that um, you two hit it off completely. Well, uh, it's nice when you meet someone else who's like minded and absolutely. and doesn't want to cut corners and and wants to produce the best, highest quality product. And Ron, um, what what can consumers do to to help um, ranchers and farmers like you um, and, and try to promote more regenerative agriculture and, and focusing on quality and, and um, the the best raising process available for beef? Well, that's probably not there's probably not an easy answer to that, uh, other than uh, dedicate the time to research uh, the suppliers and the farmers. Um, and, and how they farm, uh, there's a lot of information on our website about how we, uh, how we go about it. And I would, I would just encourage consumers to really drill into the producers, um, at your retailer, uh, even at the restaurant, uh, ask the chef, ask the butcher, uh, ask the people in the meat department, uh, about the products that they're selling, pay particular attention to the labels. <clears throat> you can weed out some things with labeling. Um, for example, um, you, you know, raise without antibiotics. That is something that has to be proven with affidavits from producers and, um, and, and before USDA will approve the use on the label. Um, another thing that we just had, and, and one thing, unfortunately, is that People do get around putting grass statements on labels that are not 100% grass fed and finished. What we have on our label is 100% grass fed and finished. So you want to look for both. Uh, remember, all cattle start out on grass. So all cattle have started their lives on grass, but they're not finished on grass. Uh, another thing that is just uh, starting to appear, we've just gotten it approved for our labels, is raised on regenerative farms. Now, one thing that I'm a little concerned about and confused about is I see some labels that just say regenerative, um, and I'm not quite sure what regenerative means. Um, I'm kind of surprised that USDA allows that term without a further explanation, but I think most of these companies explain it on their website. So again, for the consumer, it may take a little digging, but if someone says regenerative on a label, go to their website and find out what they mean. We have a pretty clear uh, outline of what regenerative means to us. And rather than just saying regenerative on our labels, our labels say raised on farms that practice regenerative agriculture. So it's it's pretty well spelled out. And I, I like that. And I think the moral of the story is care about where your food comes from and take an active right. role in knowing where your food comes from and, and educating yourself about it and desiring the best quality food. I think that's really yeah. critical. <laughs> And I think, unfortunately, that that as Americans, we've gotten uh, away from where our food comes from. You made an excellent point. Uh, a lot of people think, well, you know, our food comes from a grocery store. What else do you need yeah. to know? <laughs> uh, well, Ron, this has been an absolute pleasure for me. Great to learn more about Joyce Farms today um, and some of the excellent practices you have there. Um, where can folks find out more about Joyce Farms and the work you're doing? Um, on our website, it's uh, uh, www.joyce-farms.com. And as I tell people, uh, there may be more information on there than you want. Um, I know that uh, different people have different needs when it comes to information. Some want just the bullet points and a quick uh, uh, overview, and others want to drill deeply. And I think the way our website is set up is you can do both. Uh, we We have done for for our distributor sales team and chefs that we sell to, uh, 
to cover the difference in our genetics and what regenerative agriculture means, how the animals are raised, our animal welfare program takes about a complete seminar is about three hours. So um, it takes three hours to get a good overview of what we do uh, and how we do it and why we do it. Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, we're a family owned company. We've been in business, as you said, in the beginning, since 1962, we have now uh, made uh, the uh, transition to the third generation. I was second generation. And at that time we weren't doing any farming. Uh, we were just in the distribution business. So um, now I have two sons in the business that have been here for a few years and are very passionate about what we do. And I feel very comfortable uh, that uh, they will continue with the same standards that, that I have set. Yeah, that's amazing. And I know we've just scratched the surface today, but I think listeners will be intrigued and, and learn a lot from this. And, and I'll provide links to all that in the show notes so they can follow up and continue to learn more uh, about the great work you're doing. Thanks again for your time today, Ron. Really appreciate it. Okay, well, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or if uh, any of your uh, uh, listeners have questions about what we do. Absolutely, will do. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. You can also email me at info at carnivorecast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.